All right, everybody, this is uh, Ethan Cross uh, coming here to you on cross-examination. And today we have uh, as a guest, Anthony France. Anthony, uh, why don't you go ahead and tell your, uh, everybody a little bit about yourself and uh, what kind of books you write? Great, great, thanks. Uh, great to be here, Ethan. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm Anthony Franz. I'm lawyer by day, thriller writer by night. Um, my novels to date, uh, uh, my principal novel is uh, The Advocate's Daughter and my last novel, The Outsider. Uh, they're both uh, thrillers, uh, both set in the insular world of the U.S. Supreme Court, um, an area I know a little bit about. I'm in the appellate and Supreme Court practice of, of my um, law firm in Washington, D.C. Very nice, very nice. And uh, uh, as we were talking earlier, the the books were kind of they 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 look like John Grisham type books, but they're they're a little bit different than that. Can you? Tell yeah, me? I I like to think they're marketed as legal thrillers, which makes sense uh, from a publishing standpoint uh, uh, because they are set uh, in the legal community. I like to think of them more as um, family thrillers would be probably the best description. Uh, both books are uh, grounded in family. The main character um, of The Advocate's Daughter is a um, former uh, deputy solicitor general, which is uh, uh, one of the uh, lawyers who regularly represents the United States in the Supreme Court. And he has been, um, he's on the short list to be nominated for the U.S. Supreme Court when his daughter um, goes missing. And um, the, the story revolves around, well, well is, does this relate to his nomination or this kind of deep, dark secret he has in his past? Um, the All Outsider, uh, which is my latest book, uh, it involves a Supreme Court law clerk, kind of unconventional um, law clerk. Um, for those who aren't familiar with the Supreme Court, um, every justice of the Supreme Court every year has a crop of kind of the best and brightest uh, new law graduates who serve as their law clerks. Each gets about four clerks. And they tend to be kind of what you'd expect, you know, Yale and Harvard types who kind of lived uh, uh, in a, a privileged life and, um, you know, did really well in law school and just have always excelled at everything they, they've done. Um, the main character in The Outsider is someone who doesn't fit that bill. He's, he's kind of a, um, he's from a, a bad side of DC he went to a low-tiered law school and through a, a series of uh, events somehow lands himself this unique job amidst kind of this, this different world of the justices and these law clerks. And um, the story is about, you know, an outsider being thrust into this Supreme Court world. But, you know, it, it's a thriller. So um, the, 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 the gist of the story is, is that someone connected to the Supreme Court appears to be killing um, people in ways that seem connected to famous Supreme Court decisions. And uh, when the main character joins the Supreme Court, uh, the FBI contacts him um, because he's the only one who hasn't been at the high court when all these murders occur and they think it's somebody on the inside of the high court. Oh yeah, very cool, very cool. Yeah, and that, that's the, I, 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 as you know, probably a lot of people on this channel know, you know, I don't come from, I was in a, a tech background, which is, is helpful, you know, in writing thrillers, but the, you have such a great wealth of uh, experiences to draw on there. And actually the, uh, I would credit uh, everybody, Anthony with uh, probably the best research to book that I ever wrote was uh, Blind Justice. And uh, and we, we got to, to do a lot of uh, cool stuff. Yeah, yeah, came to DC, we had a great day. Um, we, God, I, it's been a while, we went to the Pentagon and got a behind the scenes tour and we went under the Capitol building subway and- Yeah, uh, got to ride the, the senator's book. private train. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that made it in your book. But, uh, yeah, it, it, it did actually. Yeah, no, it totally did. Uh, yeah, uh, both of the things were were huge, and that yeah, it it, it was a great uh, great trip. I think that was really the 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 first uh, 
you know, I really felt like an author. We do, we were doing all that, you know, we got to go when we got down, uh, um, when we went, so we rode the Senator's private train and then we went to the, the basement of the Capitol building and like the, the guy who was giving us the tour, you know, he's talking about like, Oh, well, this was so-and-so's room and all that, you know, for the, the different senators and stuff like that. And yeah, totally had that. Yeah, it was, yeah. Like yeah, was a fun. We're doing real author stuff here. Yeah, we were. We felt like authors. We had a good time. It's one of the things I've liked about, um, you know, the transition from lawyer to author. It took me a while. Uh, it took me a couple books really to, and I don't know if you felt the sweet thing, but, but to feel like a writer as opposed to a lawyer who just wrote a book. Mm -hmm. And it's days like that where we, you know we were actually doing author stuff and getting out in the world and being you know people are helping you do things because you're a writer that kind of makes you think, wow, well, I really, I'm actually really, really a writer. So this was a, a super fun day. I have a funny story is I, I had a, uh, that, that tour, what we got that, w that was arranged for us for the Capitol was from a friend of mine who used to be the chief of staff for a Senator. And so years later, um, when NBC was going to make a TV show out of my book, the outsider, the writer came to town and my friend, I thought he could get us a tour kind of like what we had because I uh, wanted to go around and, you know, kind of get the inside of D.C. And my friend had since moved on and um, he, um, so he, he had, a, he, he kind of passed this on to a, a younger person. And we got the worst tour you've ever had. <laughs> I, I took this poor NBC writer on you know, standing in line for an hour, getting like really probably the a worst tour that you could get if you would have just shown up on his own to get. So, so we got, you got the inside treat. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Cause yeah, we, we really, I was, I was shocked at some of the stuff that, I mean, we went like when we went to the Pentagon, we went in there and like, we didn't get to go into who was it? Uh, oh, it was like one of the top officials. We were right in his office, the Secretary of Defense, I think. I, I, yeah, I, I don't remember, but I think yeah, I think it was the Secretary of Defense's office, and we were right. We didn't get to go in it, but we were standing to where we could have just thrown something into it, you know. And you're looking in there, and we could kind of get a, a a look at it and and all that, and yeah. yeah I mean, we, well, we had that escort who was all armed and buttoned up and showing us around. It was it was it was very cool. Yeah. Yeah, actually, and the um, another cool room uh, that made it into Blind Justice that uh, was the all the nine eleven stuff that was there, and there's a, a meditation room that that was in there that I thought was pretty cool. Um, just kind of a weird, like you're just walking down the hallway, and then they, he opens a room, and there's it's just a meditation room for people. Just it was because of the nine eleven thing, you know, people who were, right, yeah, yeah, were dealing yeah. with that how it started. But I think you know, I mean, this was after years after nine eleven. I think it was just kind of a place for people to go in and right, right. And they showed us where the there were still scars on the building and stains in the building from the attack. So it was pretty pretty fast. Yeah, okay. and actually, it, the uh, I, I had someone uh, attacked in that room. Was was no. <laughs> someone got stabbed? Uh, was <laughs> tried to assa be assassinated in that room. I remember that. So, um, now we have known each other for a lot of years now through uh, ITW, the International Thriller Writers Organization. Uh, we were both debut authors uh, through their debut author program, and I think that's kind of how we really, really got to be um, good friends. Was I, I was still I was a few years before you on the, in the debut author class, but I was still doing like the, uh, I think I was doing the, the forum or the uh, men, 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 uh, mentor forum. Or yeah. The mentor forum. And we were, yeah, we were, or because what we were doing, we were organizing um, where the debut authors could meet with well-established authors and ask them questions. And it was kind of like a, a, you know, it wasn't at the time we, video really wasn't as, as prevalent. So we did, we weren't. Right. Doing but I do remember we did something like this where Lee Child, um, you know, took time out of his, his, you know, busy day where he, he didn't really know the technology even, and he figured out, you know, how to have a session like this with, I think it was 20 different uh, debut authors. And he gave us, I think it was a couple hours of his time. 
and people just ask them questions. So there's those kind of things that you arrange. And, you know, the International Thriller Writers, for anybody who doesn't know it, if you're an aspiring writer, you should learn about it. it it's, um, it's an organization dedicated to fostering thriller writers, uh, both, you know, those who are not published but, and um, those who are published. And every year, you know, we, there's a, um, a conference called Thriller Fest, which is where I, you know, Ethan and I, our, our, our wives and families often get together, uh, along with, you know, a thousand other thriller writers, uh, kind of the, the industry's trade conference. And it's just a, I can't say enough good things about the organization. It really um, supported my career uh, in ways that, that, that you know, would things that would have never happened or, or been possible, but for the generosity of the, uh, you know, more established authors and just the organization in general. Mm -hmm. Now, did you get your agent through anything with ITW or? No, you know, I, I indirectly, um, I, I had an agent for my first novel um, and I, I, there was a point where I wanted to make a change and I was, I, my first novel came out and I was in the day, ITW debut authors class and went through the um, that process, which is great. And, and for my next novels, I wasn't under contract yet, and I was thinking of uh, making a change. And ITW has, uh, for anyone looking for an agent, ITW has at Thriller Fest a section with, which is where uh, called Craft Fest, which is where there's a lot of courses taught by established writers on the craft of writing. And then at the end of uh, you know two days of kind of intense cl classroom activities, basically, there's an opportunity to pitch to some of New York and elsewhere's you know premier agents in Pitch Fest, I guess they call it. And I participated in Pitch Fest um, after my first book was published because you know it was the best way to get face to face with agents before I. Um, anything came to fruition through uh, another ITW member, of, you know, a kind of somebody who's taken me under her wing, a very established author. Um, you know, she was in DC and, and you know, uh, we got together for dinner and, you know, we came to be talking about my next book and I talked to her about it. She said, oh, send me the pages. I just want to see it. And from that, she said, you know, I, I really loved it. I, you know, if it's okay with you, I'll share it with my agent. Her agent was one of the you know best agents in the business, frankly. And um, you know, the next thing you know, that's been my agent for seven years now. And I I can't tell you. I hope I never have another agent. I think she's been one of the best things in my writing career. Has gotten me multiple book deals and has just been um, really. I, you know, I'm a lawyer. I represent clients for a living, and she's you know, the best representative that I could ever hope for for myself. So, you know, it was an indirect way. I didn't get it through Fuller Fest, but I got it through ITW because of, you know, people I met and people who helped me along the way. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I would echo a similar um, situation for me. I went and pitched at Thriller Fest the first year that I went there and, uh, and had good response, had a lot of uh, people interested and I didn't send to uh, a single one of them because through a contact I had met at standing in line at the, it was standing in line to pay at the bookstore that they had there set up. I met another author uh, and started talking with him and, and he ended up um, sending me on to uh, a freelance editor. The way he had done things was he, he worked with a freelance editor actually before he um, sent his stuff out. And so I, I kind of followed that path and, and worked with a freelance editor to, to build my stuff up. And then the freelance editor actually introduced me to my agent. So, so yeah, yeah. That, that, that kind of, yeah, e even though the, you know, so, so that's a good thing for, for everybody who's going there to pitch, even if you don't be discouraged by, um, you know, if you go to pitch fest and, and don't have, you know, don't think people are being receptive. You know, you can, there, there's still all these other avenues out there that, uh, you know, you, you can meet people. And so, yeah, I, I think that's what, I mean, I tell people, um, you know, you probably got a lot of readers and watching the show, but there's, there may be some aspiring writers. Uh, you know, what I didn't realize and what I tell people now is, is, is you got to treat, 
writing like a job. And when you're in a career, you go to trade shows, you go to conferences to network and meet people. And it shouldn't be any different for writing. And so whether it's the International Thriller Writers Conference or the Mystery Writers of America Conference or whatever, you know, part of becoming a professional in this business, I think, is, is treating it like a profession, like you would any other profession. And like, you know, as a lawyer, I never thought twice about going to conferences. I still don't. I go to many for a variety of reasons. And I think if you're, if you want to be a writer or particularly a thriller writer or a mystery writer, you should take the same approach. Absolutely. Yeah. I give the, the exact same advice to, to anyone who's, who's wanting to do it. And, and this year actually would be a, a great year uh, as, as we were discussing earlier um, because they're going to be doing a virtual thriller fest. Um, so we, we don't know the details of what that'll be like yet, but, but when, when that comes, uh, what's what's right, the main right. thr- what's the main thrillerwriters.org is the main yeah you should I mean, if you're interested you know i think you should check on the website for the international thriller writers to get details but unfortunately because of the situation we're in uh thriller fest the annual conference i mentioned had to be canceled this year which was a responsible and smart thing to do um but they're trying to make you know lemonade out of it and they're going to hold a number of virtual conferences a lot of big name authors are still going to participate there's going to be a lot of big, Built, uh, opportunities to interact um, like we are um, virtually, but um, you know, the, I think the, the details are being rolled out soon, so you should just definitely check check the International Thor Writers website for that. I think it's definitely fun. Yeah, very cool. So, of course, uh, as you mentioned there, you were all uh, living in, in these quarantined times and uh, changing the way that we do things uh, quite a bit. Um, and it's, you know, when, even when it's first started before we were really feeling it here in America, um, I kind of saw the writing on the wall, so to speak, coming because the, uh, the book fair in Germany had been canceled. And this was, you know, as most of the the people watching this will probably know, I'm, I do uh, a fair bit of business over in Germany and have a lot of German fans and uh, my German publisher, that was You're weird. being modest. You're the biggest deal in Germany ever. Uh, yes. It's, it's me and Hasselhoff. You know, <laughs> yeah. Me and Hasselhoff are organizing a tour coming up. It's going to, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so, so over in uh, Germany, my German publisher, the way that they always did things was they meet, met at the, uh, the book, the Frankfurt, uh, book fair and that was canceled and so it was kind of it was almost weird like where they had this thing like oh well now I guess we'll just email each other you know I'm like you, you can do that just talk about it you know <laughs> you can work out the contract details over over email but uh, but how are people uh, there and you live in in uh, near Washington DC uh, how, how are people handling COVID and how is this how has it affected you? And yeah, your- see, um, well, you know, I, I work downtown DC and I, I live just outside the city. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think it's been obviously like for everyone else, it's been a huge adjustment. My law firm, which has, you know, 600 lawyers um, and a number of other, um, you know, uh, professionals, uh, we closed the, the whole entire office closed, and so we had to adjust to a new uh, way of you know practicing law and and, uh, and you know dealing with uh, with that and, and and how courts are, are responding and how um, you know trials that have to take place you can't get uh, put a bunch of juries together and, um, and and all of those type of things and you don't want to um, you know be irresponsible and I think that the courts are grappling with it as well. As a writer, um, you know, it, for me, it's it's writing, as you know, even as a solitary thing you do in a room by yourself anyway. So that in that respect, it wasn't it hasn't been a major um, change. I mean, I think that I have gone through you know things like everybody else, which is you know, does my supermarket have toilet paper and paper towels or what are the things we're going to need? Um, I've probably. Uh, uh, probably our liquor store has gotten more business than it has in many years. And, and the challenge is whether you're risk willing to risk the danger of going inside. Uh, uh, 
I have been, or at least curbside pickup, uh, we've, we've gone up the, the, uh, the, the, the people there are starting to judge my family, I think, by how many times. Well, but, but that you can't get infected from stuff that, from that, because it kills the germs, right? <laughs> well, that, that's what I keep telling my wife. And, my kids. <laughs> um, and speaking of my kids, I mean, it's, it's been a blessing, uh, you know, a blessing and a curse. I don't know if that's the right way to put it, but, you know, having two kids away at college, I have a son at NYU who's a senior and a daughter who's a freshman uh, in, in Colorado. And it's been pretty disruptive of their lives. You know, my son was a senior who's going to miss graduation and all of those things. And he's had to come home and, you know, he just, he had his birthday uh, yesterday. He turned 22. And can you imagine the depressing birthday you had to hang out with your dad and your mom and your siblings on your 22nd birthday? Um, and my daughter has had to kind of leave the dorm and her friends and all of that and adjust to, um, you know, remote cl you know, court classes. Uh, but on the whole, you know, we're lucky people, we're, we're well, um, we're, we're fine, we, you know, so we're, we're, we're staying optimistic and trying to recognize that, like, there's just a lot of people who have been sick or lost people who, or have lost their jobs or have had many more hardships. So when we get frustrated, we, we definitely try to remember that. Yeah, definitely. Well, and, and like you say, we're, you know, um, both you with, with, your legal, you know, the, the, your legal pursuits. I know you, you didn't, a lot of what you do, did was more the back end office type, type. Yeah. Stuff. I, you right. know, I'm an appellate lawyer mostly. So a lot of that is writing. Um, and, um, and so, you know, I, I worked from home quite a bit already because it, it, it again, it's a solitary endeavor, both in my law practice and, and in my writing uh, career. But, um, but it's still an adjustment to, you know, be away from the office and, and, and you know, adjust just that way. But it, for, I'd say it's probably been much less disruptive for me professionally as a lawyer and writer than it has been for, you know, many other people, lawyers who go to court all the time and, um, or, have, or, or who travel a lot, which I, which I don't tend to do. Yeah. Yeah. I, so we, we were in the same boat then been really blessed that uh that we can kind of keep keep going with our with our daily lives without being disrupted right the way that a lot of people have now you, you mentioned your your kids something i found i also have uh actually have a senior going through the same college senior going through the oh, same, right. same thing with my daughter and then my son who just got out of the marines is is home uh as well for because he had, he got out of the marines and then started going to college and you know they're so they're both they both uh moved back home and so we could quarantine together but uh something that i found interesting with them and and really in a, in our area but especially something that i've i've kind of got the sense of talking to them well my my son made the the comment the other night you look on when he looks on instagram and snapchat and things like that He's seeing these young people his age out, out at parties and doing this stuff and, and, and things like that. Have you experienced any of that with, with your kids trying to, you know, that, that their friends are not uh, keeping up with the quarantine the way that they should be? You know, no, I really haven't. I mean, I think that um, the, their friends and, and classmates have been pretty responsible about it. Um, you know, I think at the beginning, early stages, you know, it was a little different when they weren't quite grasping that this was a real thing. And I think that, that there was some resistance. But now I think they're more along the lines of let's, you know, let's keep doing this now so we don't have to, you know, open up and go back and then do it again. You know, they just want to get right. it to be done once and for all. And so they're being pretty sensible about it. Um, you know, I don't know if it's easier or not for them, you know, they're much more social media phone based people than I am and they probably you are. Um, so I think that cuts both ways, you know, they might see people out doing things, but at the same time, it gives them, unlike when we were young, it gives them the ability to still connect with people, with their peers and their, and their friends and everything, um, that maybe we didn't have. So, uh, you know, I think. My, my kids are definitely ready for this to be over, but they're, they're still hanging in there pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, it, it 
something that if we all just pull together and do what we're supposed to do, right? Yeah. You know, it, it, uh, so I, I get you know, it. Very quickly, but yeah. you know, not gonna work. Yeah. It, it, it's it seems like a lot of people are are. You know, and, and there's a lot of factors, you know, economic factors. Oh, yeah, sure. You know, look, I don't, you know, we, we have the luxury of working at home and, and writing books and doing these things. And I get it. But I get that there's, there's certain um, things that I can't relate to that are driving this kind of real need to get out there. But, you know, hopefully we, we all are looking back on this in a few months from now and things are starting to get seem, you know, relatively normal again. But we will see. Well, and I know uh, here in, uh, in Illinois, we recently, um, they, they advised masks, you know, had, had a thing where it's, you're supposed to wear a mask whenever you go out. Um, and so I, I think that's a big thing. If people just keep up the, the, the masks, we got a, we got another star. On the yeah. Show. You got, a, you got some, you got a, a star in the back. Right? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, now we're pretty mandatory masks. Most of our stores you can't go into without a mask here. And, um, uh, the ones that are open. So, yeah, I, mean, I think that's right. I, I just, you know, hopefully people will continue just not to get too fatigued by it and let, let their guard down or just say, I can't do this anymore and <laughs> just go out. Um, but I think, you know, hopefully it's coming on May, we get through May, we'll see how it goes. It's, just, it's, it's definitely tough. Yep. Well, Anthony, it has uh, uh, been a real pleasure here uh, talking. No, great, great to see you, man. I haven't seen you in so long. It's, it's really great to see your face again. I'm glad you're doing well. And uh, congratulations on all the success on the books. It's just, you know, I, I knew you when, so it's, it's always great to see. And I love all the guitars in the background, as I said, too. It makes, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes sometime you're going to have to get over here and try some of them out. Yeah, definitely. I definitely record know. something in the studio. As uh, we were discussing uh, before we before we started recording here, we're, we're both guitar players and musicians and stuff. And so we, we've, we, we both experienced, uh, you know, I've got a, a full digital studio here, but we both experienced the old four track task cam recorders and, and the, the days of analog, which, which really is, is like magic to me. I saw something the other day with like Pink Floyd uh, recording Dark Side of the Moon. And, you know, they're, they're like, we're going to run out of tape, right. you know, and all this stuff. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. You, you have that ca uh, capability in your, in your, you know, your one computer back there. And so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's amazing. And, well, and even them just talking about like, oh, I can't, we can't do this. We can't splice this too many times. The tape's going to wear out and the, you know, it's just like, what is a total different. And actually the, it wasn't that long ago. I, I saw something with uh, Metallica and the Black Album that they mm -hmm. were recording and they had the, the same, we're saying the same kind of stuff. Like they were recording it on tape and I'm like, mm -hmm. what? That was like 1990. What? And, and then you realize that we're old. That we're old. I was just going to say 1990 was a long time ago. That was a long time ago. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's a blink of an eye. So that's great. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, well great. Well, have a great Thank you for time. having me. Yep. I'll see you, I hope, next year at Thriller Fest. And uh, until then, you, you stay well. I'm sure we'll talk sooner then. But thank you for having me.